Welcome to a very special discussion on the most happening discussion in town of the sports industry year. So today I have four great panelists, all experts and professionals in their own right, all have something to do or everything to do actually for this uh, episode's discussion on the sports industry and we're looking at marketing football in Malaysia and even in ASEAN but before that it's no secret that Asia is rising ASEAN is rising economically we're seeing transition from the most developed nations around the world and they all flowing to Asia and Asia is greatly rising football is very popular but when we talk about what do you know about the sports industry, especially the football industry? People can hardly tell me any local club and what their revenues are, for example. So with that, I want to start the discussion today because we do know that the top 20 clubs in the world, according to Deloitte, have a revenue of about 4.4 billion euro for the 2010-2011 season. Real Madrid, for example, has a revenue of 480 million euro for the 2010 and 2011 season. So with that, we want to see our clubs gaining close, if not as much, even though it's in ringgit, I'll be happy with 480 million. <laughs> I'll ask my panelists later. But uh, I will start by introducing ladies first, as always. Uh, my Liverpool connection, I call her. <laughs> She's Poin Sophia Sui, the Director of Education from France United Football Academy. France United has been introduced to me in the studio of Awani because I met this very passionate guy arguing the case that France is the first and the only football independent academy that really looks strategically at uh, producing a local global football player. I'll argue and debate that with okay. Pan Supriya <laughs> later. But then I have uh, Mr. Manve uh, uh, Jasudasan and he is one, in one of the most interesting football league for me because I usually only watch uh, the BPL and also La Liga but he made me go on ground and look at grassroots football and that is very important because he's the communication director of Sports Guru Asia which has very direct link to Junior Football League and of course somebody who's been on our knee off and on again and uh, we see him in football, mm. we see him around basketball and he's no other than uh, Mr. Ruben Emer Gunnerlingham. Thank you so much for making time. He is the co-owner of Queen Park Rangers and of course West Sports Malaysia Dragons. And uh, I'll come back to this dragon thing because I went to a national school where the only ball we know we must either kick or hit with a stick but he plays with his hands. So we go to Safiro, last and not least, uh, my partner in crime in the media circle before, but he turned for the more lucrative area. That's why I, we wrote him in, because he's looking at the sports industry from a myriad of perspectives, events, communication, and stuff like that. So I'll come back to my uh, hypothesis before, that if Asia is rising, then surely the sports industry, including football industry, in countries in Asia, like Malaysia and ASEAN, should be rising too. However, we keep hearing of simple things and simple stuff, like players not getting their pay for a few months. And if that is the case, then no wonder some stadium, and I've been to a stadium, my producer for today lives in Slayang, and there's a lot of exciting football matches now being, uh, you know, they play in the Slayang Stadium. But sometimes, it's not even half full. It's nearly empty. And the matches played are quite exciting. So this is the thing. I want to start this discussion today first and foremost. If we don't manage the business of the fans, manage the fans, we are not managing the business of football, let alone the marketing side. So I want to go to Ruben first. Sure. Because people say that of course we have the football industry. We always see the EPL clubs coming. But we don't want to talk about the football clubs of Europe and coming here, making money and then bringing that money back. What we want is also for them to invest, maybe FDI like, billions of ringgit into this country. Isn't that a fair request <laughs> from a layman? Well, um, <coughs> I don't know if that will happen anytime soon, but yes. you can see that, um, as you say, Asia is rising. And, and the, the reason why it's very clear uh, that it's happening is because um, most sports around the world now um, cater to Asia. 
you can see the English Premier League was the first one to do it by having their game time suit to suitable to Asian timing so that the Asian fans can actually watch the game over there, I mean over here. And you can see La Liga now, the one, the one league that was very, very adamant of starting the games at night and uh, fixing it towards the siesta in Spain. They're also trying to, uh, you know, trying to mm -hmm. attract this market now. So, and also, the, if you watch the, um, the US sports, the, especially the NBA, mm -hmm. which feels that Asia is a big market, they're now changing their schedules to suit Asia as well. So that, I think that's the, the clear indication that Asia is definitely rising. And the, these clubs from those countries and these leagues from those countries want to tap into this market for the TV revenue. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the biggest revenue source from any of uh, any sport is actually TV money. Yeah. Nothing else beats TV money in any sport uh, worldwide, including the Olympics. The only reason the Olympics is such a big spectacle is because the TV money that goes into the Olympics is in the billions of dollars. So, yeah. so TV money is very key. So now, how do we? Why do we not able to 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 reach that kind of standard in terms of the industry? Is because I think, as you rightly mentioned at the beginning of this of the episode, I mean this 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 program, that. People don't look at it as an industry. They still, a lot of people still, unfortunately, see this um, see football as a sport. Um, I don't see football as a sport. I see football as a form of entertainment. And if you're if you're a form of entertainment, you're competing not just against basketball, or hockey, or, or badminton. You're competing also against cinema or okay. or HBO mm -hmm. or, or going to a club or going to karaoke or going to whatever other thing yeah. you want to do. So if you cannot get the people's attention and get them to pay money uh, to enjoy something like this, then you never actually be able to build an industry. Okay. And until we can, it, we're able to understand that it is a form of entertainment, and the most important thing are the fans, um, I don't think people understand how to, to, to take this a step further. Okay. There are many clubs in <coughs> Malaysia, who, um, football teams in Malaysia, playing in the current league or so, who, you know, um, who are struggling to meet financial requirements. And when I ask them, why are you doing this? It's basically to keep the club alive, but okay. why do you want to keep the club alive? And none of them say because of the fans. Okay. They want to keep the club alive because of the structure of the administration of the people. Of the it's there, so it must run. It's there, so it must run. They want to keep it there because of the football players. I see, for me, you cannot keep a club running just because of the players. Yeah. The players can find other clubs to play for. But the fans are the ones that actually determine the revenue source here. And if you cannot bring in the fans, you can forget about ticket revenue, yeah. you can forget about merchandising, you can forget about sponsorship, you can forget about TV money. Correct. And without this, you cannot build anything here. That's so why I must go to Safir on next, because before he turned traitor, he was in the media, and now he is on the other side, so he can link the two. You said that TV money is important, but I say, before EPL became BPL, you know, now it's Barclays Premier League, they already had that fan management thing going. People were going to the stadiums, they were packed, season tickets, people queue, like waiting for the next iPhone, for example. <coughs> and we used to have that in this country. I remember queuing for a long, long time on the shoulders of my father, just to get a ticket to watch Mokta Dari, the late Mokta Dari, to play. You know, so where has that gone? And is it because, like Ruben said, because it's there. And we have all along, from the beginning, started with the state-based concept, even for our football class. So now that, just because Saim Dhabi is there, that's still in the minority, not the mainstream. The bigger players are from the clubs that are not state, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of hope, but in terms of the structure, more and more, we are still relying on the old infrastructure of the state club leading. So, how do you look at that? Uh, well, Malaysian football, uh, in terms of the league, um, be it semi-pro, or um, uh, now it's a so-called professional league, uh, football has always been territorial. So, um, you know, if you're a Kedah, you ex before, if, you, if it's a Kedah team, you expect all the players are the best from Kedah, yes. and then all the Kedahans will support no matter where they are. Yeah. Um, and then Slango, and then you have the rivalries and all that. So the the passion is is still there, but the problem with our society, especially football fans, we always give excuses. Okay. We always say that, or oh, the turning point was, uh, you know, when there was corruption in football. That that okay. big, yes. you know, mass. Uh, uh, players where they caught because of corruption and people just stop going to stadium that cannot be 
the reason because we keep giving excuses. Another excuse is that there was a vacuum of sponsorship when the Secret Boys were, yes. were doing it. And I, I, I think we are the only league that is actually going down a bit in terms of sponsorship revenue uh, compared to before. Mm -hmm. uh, that cannot be the reason anymore. Uh, the government was trying to help here and there, but still they need to be a shift <coughs> from this uh, CSR concept okay. or where uh, government money and also GLCs Okay. You know, you're talking about arm twisting yeah. and all that, to go and invest in football. Okay. Can I, can I just... Uh, Robert, I have to go for the first break. Sure, I'll sure. come back to you, but I will, I'm not forgetting you two guys. <laughs> we'll, we'll go to that later because they are the good stories. First, we go to the critics. But if I can differ a bit with Safiro, if, if I got my homework done correctly, Kelantan defied the odds and they are having quite a good revenue stream coming in. They're not even relying on the government or the state government. It's all relying on the private sector and their online presence. That's quite a big thing for Malaysia, but not in the UK maybe. But in Malaysia, football entity doing successfully online, that's another thing altogether. And they are still state-based. So let's back to differ a bit from Safiro and go to Ruben after this. Okay.